I'm having a slight problem with the projector here, projecting slides from my Macintosh for some reason. Sure, uh, but uh, I had this problem before, and it normally auto detects great. Last yeah. week I was at the 802 meeting in San Antonio, and um, not detecting it as So what we did, um, actually, what we tried the last one is in this, some guy with the meat echo had a different adapter which included uh, HDMI. Yeah, you we plugged into yeah. HDMI and UP USB over here and it still didn't work, so I used my co-chair's PC. Mm. So... That's weird. 
Um, yeah. So except for the fact that I'll have to download them because there aren't, I actually carry around the PC all the time because that's what Huawei gives me. But I do most of my work on my Mac. Um, so. Yeah. That's, I would recommend turning it off and on again as the usual thing. That sure. Lose the state you have. What state? I, I mean, mean yeah, you have yeah. unsaved documents and stuff. Well, I should find out about that, shouldn't I? <laughs> Let's see. So we want to just do a restart, I assume. What kind of? Should I leave this plugged in while? It, yeah, yeah. Let's, okay. Let's try that. Sure. Um, but by the way, I sent an email to us a while back about like how I, how I wrote my own implementation of Babel. I think yes. it would make sense to. Come uh, in. You have problem with the. Ah, that could help. Right, but yeah, I just I decided so just did a restart here. So. Yeah, let's, uh, let's try that. But yeah, that, this is in oh HDMI. To, HDMI yeah. The, the GGA? Oh, I've never seen one like this. Oh, neat. <coughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, if it doesn't pick it up. Okay, try that. Oh, awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, it has, uh, the right power. Yeah. Additional. Sweet. Ah, uh, so that, that looks, looks no, yes. No. Okay, so I guess that was the trick. Yeah, um, when new shit happens, that's the... When all else fails, we start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, on that note, uh, I was thinking of just going oh. to the mic at some point and just telling it for the people who didn't see the email. When do, would you rather I do that? Sure. After yeah. the agenda or... or yeah, that will be good. After I the agenda, but before the first uh, talk, it seems great. Oh, thanks. Um, we seem to have solved the technical problem, so we'll get started in just a second here. Okay, so this is the Babel working group, uh, or Babel as you choose. Um, I don't know about this standardization stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm Donald Eastlake with Huawei and uh, Russ White. Uh, it looks like Dan is the co-chair, but he has uh, left the meeting already. Um, so everybody should be aware of the note well by now. This is the last slot of the week. You I don't know how many times you've probably seen this before, but anything you uh, input to the working group process here is subject to IPR disclosure. Uh, and people should also note that uh, the way we get quality documents, uh, it's not just by writing them, but by also reviewing other ones and getting uh, multiple people's opinions, uh, uh, resolving differences and so forth. And, uh, ending up with consensus. So if you want your documents reviewed uh, to improve their quality, you should review other people's documents. So this is what I have for the agenda. Uh, do I have uh, Jabber Scribe and uh, no, Minutes Scribe here and Minutes Taker? Okay. Uh, does uh, Jabber is also important. Is there somebody here who can monitor Jabber and uh, they don't it'd be good for them to just input a little bit when things happen, but the main thing is to check if there's anybody remote who wants to put a question into the Jabber room. Uh, people who are remote on Meet Echo could uh, request to be recognized and they can then just talk to us and so forth, but people who are just uh, remote listening to the audio stream 
rather than meet echo might be on Jabber. Uh, anybody on Jabber? No? Uh, I guess. So uh, we have, it looks like we have a relatively brief meeting unless uh, other things come up. I'll go a little bit over what the status is of documents and, and so forth. Um, we have two presentations, um, one remote, and um, that's what I currently have for the meeting. So it should take significantly less than the hour and a half I think we have scheduled uh, for this, and people can, uh, can get out early. So uh, anybody has questions or things they want to add, feel free to rig in here. Uh, you want to put it down? Sure. Okay. Hi, David Skenazi, Apple. I just wanted to quickly reiterate uh, an email I sent to the mailing list a while back. Uh, so I've been following Babel for a while, and I've successfully written my own implementation exclusively from the RFC, not looking at any other source code. And I just wanted to say that the RFC was very clear, and it was uh, very, not hard and it was great I was very happy with the way the protocol works and I've already sent like some comments for like the BIS one to the list so good job on the first one and let's make the BIS even better thank you very much any uh, other comments or input at this point all right okay I'll go into some status here so there are two working group drafts uh, the uh, applicability draft, and also a uh, draft version uh, from RFC 6126. So the basically the initial goal of the working group, uh, besides the applicability documents, primarily to get the standards, the, the experimental RFCs, the ones listed at the bottom of this slide, and make them uh, into standard track RFCs, uh, combining the uh, uh, extension mechanism into the base routing protocol document and incorporating a few minor errors and you know possible ambiguities and glitches that have been found. So uh, the base RFC has been converted to draft without uh, I believe any significant changes uh, and um, there is a base applicability draft we can work on. Uh, there's a related information model draft and uh, there's a draft in the HomeNet working group uh, concerning Babel because Babel is the mandatory to implement routing protocol for HomeNet. So uh, going just through what the state is, we do have, do have milestones and uh, the first couple have been accomplished. Uh, we are a little behind on the one on adopting a information model or Yang model draft as a working group draft. So uh, and then we do after that we do uh, we are supposed to uh, submit the various documents to the uh, IESG and um, there are possible other tasks and things in the charter we don't have to have milestones for every everything we do uh, but uh, we should do the things we have milestones for <laughs> or or at least if we decide not to we should get rid of the milestone or do something So, um, I guess the uh, first talk, unless okay, somebody wants to bring up anything else, is the clarifications and updates to the Babel TLV processing by the Dennis Ozienko. And uh, I guess I can get those um, display that pretty easily. So, we want to go to uh, to uh, full screen. Um, so, Dennis, if you request, uh, I think you have to do something to request uh, that you get you participate and become the speaker. Uh, I see a little small window for you. Um, um, hello. Um, hi. I'm not sure how it looks. Ah, there we go. Okay, it looks fine now. Can you guide me? So I can already speak, and everything is set up on the big screen, right? Yes. Perfect. Do you want me to go? Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to our small working session. Um, the 
work I'm working to present is code qualifications and uh, updates, and um, it consists of two sections. First is qualifications, and another is updates. But uh, both of those sections they come from the same uh, background. Uh, that is when I was looking through RFC 4593, which is a security considerations RFC to see uh, how my previous work might be useful um, for the standards development process. I was reading through and through, and then I had found something interesting and started to dig into it deeper and deeper until I had a series of notes that I had like converted into this pre presentation. Because I think um, I have reached the point where I need some feedback, and we need to consider this all together to uh, make Babel a Babel protocol with a better specification. So on the next slide is the beginning of the first section. And it looks into how bidirectional reachability detection works in Babel and how it is related with the rest of the protocol. Because in the scope of this, of this talk, I have to separate the, um, the two points of view on this bidirectional reachability. Uh, and in this part, I'm looking how it works with the rest of the protocol. Please, the next slide. If you're familiar with the RFC 6126, um, here are the sections that I had to read through thoroughly and study how it actually works. And um, one thing that I want to point out is that um, it seems to me some normative text belongs to section 3. Three, four, but in the document it appears in Appendix A1 because uh, how the document goes in one of the sections, 341, it says how to deal with received Hello TOVs and what statistics to maintain are considered local implementation matters. Typically, a node will maintain some sort of history and so on, so on, so on. And then in the actual appendix, it says. Uh, it goes into deeper details that I think should be in, in that basic section because some of the mm, some of the things in the specification should be left up to implementer and some others they should be the same for all implementers. And I hope to discuss that that's one of the points I have figured out and I will discuss it later. Now the on the next um so those three sections I tried to put together as a text, and it took me some time. Then I had pulled it together as a diagram, and it became slightly more easier to understand. And on this diagram, you can see two speakers uh, exchanging TOVs, uh, which roughly stands for exchanging packets. But in Babel, TOVs can be um, in Babel's, in Babel, TOVs can go in a packet in a way that mm, that allows them to combine. That's the design of the protocol. And here you can see that two speakers are exchanging TOVs, and they go through particular stages. Mm, first is to exchange hello TOVs. Second is to exchange IHU, which is I heard you TOV, and then the mm, the whole point of the protocol to exchange the routing information. And it looks almost fine, almost fine, except there is one problem. If you look at it, um, the tension, you can see that the bottom part doesn't depend on the top part. And that represents not how the code is currently implemented. That represents how the specification tells implementers to implement this. So that if you follow the specification, um, as it goes on paper, uh, it's quite possible for you to end up with an implementation that has the bidirectional uh, detection on one side and the rest of the protocol on the other. And the rest of the protocol can 
work as far as the specification is concerned without doing the bidirectional change first. Mm. And the next slide try to, tries to explain it, what the problems are with this, mm, with this graph. So, uh, there are three points that I'm making, and uh, the, the directional reachability in, from, from one point of view, it works as intended, uh, as you can see, then there is one point that is not quite uh, obvious, at least maybe to some readers of the spec, it's that um, to maintain a neighbor, you need two TOVs coming at reasonable time intervals. One is hello, and another is IHU. And the specification doesn't tell it explicitly, but you can reconstruct this requirement if you read through one section, then the other, another, another, another. And if you don't read through and you don't match one bit of the spec to another, you can miss this fact. So that mm -hmm. the difference here would be if a similar protocol would use similar TOVs and it would depend on HU TOVs only to maintain their neighbors that have that that a speaker has already acquired. In this case, it would be a slightly different protocol that uh, would allow, for instance, to acquire neighbors and then to switch to a different mode that would maintain existing neighbors and not acquire any new neighbors. If that was the goal of the design, then uh, it would be how it would be achieved. But in this case, it wasn't a goal and it wasn't achieved, so that's uh, a mere fact that you need both kinds of theories coming into a protocol instance to keep things back in. And then, the, but that's more an editorial issue. And then the real issue is that there is no dependency where it seems to be dependency. Uh, and on the next slide, I'm trying to address that uh, missing dependency. That's it. Uh, that's more like what you see in um, protocol specifications. For instance, in OSPF, you have to make uh, a neighbor through a two-way exchange. In BGP, you have to make um, a neighbor through initial connection setup, then go through states, and then you can exchange the route information. Uh, and you have to negotiate capabilities before you actually start to use them, which is reasonable. And to define those properties of protocols, it's common to use finite state machines or finite state automatons. Uh, and that's a finite state machine on the screen, uh, which uh, it seems to me represents what was actually intended in the spec. Uh, a neighbor first have to prove uh, one way reachability, and then it has to prove two way reachability, and then it can do the rest of the protocol exchange, which to me seems reasonable. And uh, this state machine represents this transition. So that if this state machine um, is actually what was meant, if if I'm right in what I have inferred from the specification, not what's on the paper, uh, then I propose to use this as mm, mm, to use this to update the text to state it explicitly that a neighbor first has to make it through um, the bidirectional reachability, and then it can do certain things. If you look at the diagram, I don't know if you can read the um, smaller text on the um, on the green. I take it it's a color, color projector, right? Uh, you know, people can download it and look at it on, on their machines also. So it's pretty pretty clear, I think. So you, you can see some bits are yellow, and another uh, other bits are green, right? Yes. So, on the green bits, uh, the color doesn't mean anything. It's just to distinguish between one and the other. Uh, but that's, 
the same color as on the previous diagram. Now, on the green portion of the slide, you can see um, on an, an acknowledgement TOV do question marks. And that stands for another problem in the spec, because in the spec you can see um, part of a specification for acknowledgement exchange, but the other part is missing as far as the text is concerned. Um, and that needs to be fixed. Uh, it, it just needs to be fixed because that makes the specification not consistent. And without that missing part, I couldn't produce a more accurate graph uh, for this diagram. So it, it's approximate. In a more complete graph, you would see a couple more timers for the handling of acknowledgements. And there probably would be a few more transitions between state for missed acknowledgements and received acknowledgements. So it's, a, it's actually more complicated in details, but the overall setup that I think should be correct is like this. First, it doesn't exist, then it makes into the yellow area, and then into the green area. And mm, that's pretty much straightforward. And on the next slide, I try to summarize the, the points that the first section concerns. First, the text in the appendix, uh, I propose to review it and to move some of the text to section that describes protocol operation to make it easier for an implementer and not just for implementer, to make the text more consistent in that everything that is normative remains in the main body of the document and then anything that is optional or goes in as an example or as a possible way to implement it goes in the appendix that makes it just more logical to and easier to understand so that people can see what's the basic specification and what's there um, what's anything that's more than the basic specification then um, for for the TOVs that, as far as I understand, must uh, only be considered after two-way exchange is completed, I propose to make such updates as to state explicit, explicitly in the spec that um, they must be ignored unless within this condition has been met. Or because I could be wrong in some cases, uh, for instance, for for an update TOV, you cannot reasonably you cannot reasonably process an update TOV without a neighbor. But perhaps uh, it, it could be possible that an acknowledgement TOV makes particular sense without a neighbor. Maybe I I just have to allow for this. Why not? Maybe that's how it should be. So. For every TOV, we should state in the spec that either they must not be processed in any way before the bidirectional reachability is in place, or either they should, either they must, or they must not. For every other TOV type, we should have it in the spec said so that then the implementers don't have to guess and they don't have to infer the implied sense from every other details in all the other places. It just needs to be said. Then the next point is um, pretty much simple, just um, a few sentences in the right place that just should explain that to maintain a proper uh, neighbor in the protocol uh, instance, you need to receive both hello and both HUTOVs. And respectively, on the other side, you need to send them. Uh, so you send hello all the time. And then once there is a bidirectional reachability condition, you must continue to send those hellos in addition to the HUs you are sending. 
um, I think a couple of sentences of, of this kind in the right place, they would save a lot of time digging through the text and putting details together. And the final bit for this session is about acknowledgement theories and I haven't got any suggestions um, um, how to deal with the acknowledgement theories, but at the very least I was able to figure the problem out. Some part of the spec is missing and we need to do something about it. Um, then the second section regards... Um, Hi, the, Dennis. The, uh, quick question. Yes. Uh, uh, David Skenazi from Apple here. Just uh, this previous part, uh, you mentioned discussion. Do you want to have it after your second part or do you want to discuss the first part now and then do the second one? Um, I suggest I talk through the slides and then if you have time I will be glad to answer any questions if you have. Sounds good. That, Thanks. That's the whole point of me doing this talk to get some questions and get comments. So questions are welcome but um, just in case if I'm running out of time, I want to to make it through the other section, and that will hopefully make it easier for those who are following to see how those two bits are related together, because they are actually related together, and one doesn't make much sense without the other. They, um, the first part of the problem and the second part, they they, they, they will work best when they're solved together. And the second problem is, uh, in the slide it's called suggested updates, because it states the problem and it suggests a few options to resolve it, but um, we need to think about it more. It's not just um, fixing some uh, text in the spec, it's, it's more design. Then, uh, the second section concerns how the bidirectional reachability um, mechanism works in Babel. And the, the interesting bit I had found, or I think I have found, is that there are ways for the bidirectional reachability to fail even with the presence of the cryptographic authentication mechanism working. And on the next slide you can see how exactly it can happen. Consider the following topology. It's simple and for instance this is a town and there are two students, two friends, living in different parts of the town, on two streets, then on a weekend uh, one decides to visit the other and uh, they agree that they would each has a, um, for instance, a small cluster of embedded computers in a box and to route the network for the cluster there is a Babel speaker on the outside. So they agreed to uh, meet on the weekend and one brings his box of embedded computers, his portable cluster, to the premises of the other. That's what they agreed to do. And on the next slide you can see what they do. Now, uh, they connect to the same segment. And what they expect to happen is actually what happens. Is, is that the two uh, speakers talk to each other and two networks can talk to each other. So that's what they were expecting to happen and that's uh, nothing interesting yet. The interesting bit is uh, the Queen Street segment, uh, the segment through which they're working. It uses authentication. And they expect that once the um, neighbor 
detection has worked and once the routes has been exchanged that it will remain and it will be protected from interference from any other um, let's say um, device on the same segments uh, there is a question are the cloud things routers or switches the cloud things are networks connected together so those are each cloud is a segment of a network in generic sense it just tells on the diagram it just represents that those two routers were not uh, connected directly to each other before and now they are connected directly to each other uh, then those two students connect those two routers through that uh, local segment it's all authenticated it's all working so they leave it to work and go away now on the next slide you see what happens the green dash to line here represents that the neighborish ability now disappears and the two networks networks cannot reach each other because the neighbors are not neighbors anymore and those two speakers don't exchange the routes anymore so uh, the owners of the speakers and the networks they don't notice their failure and they just leave it for the next 24 hours they think that everything is working but in fact it's not working but they just leave it as it is and then 24 hours later they just uh, the guy that was the guest disconnects his box of all the research stuff that he carries around disconnects the box and goes home 24 hours later and on the next slide you see the interesting bit that happens uh, the second guy went home the owner of the router B the truths network B and the owner of the router A the trans network A wants to connect to network B again uh, and what he thinks is going on is that he connects to network B what in fact happens here is that he connects to network B that is not network B but is a network with the same prefix and different contents and the speaker that advertises that network B is not the router B it's router B asterisk which means it's a fake router B but still router A believes it's router B and it accepts the update from that um, uh, router B asterisk and and router A now has two routes to the network B one is uh, more preferred route a local one and another is the route from the other part of the of the town and of course the the left speaker decides that the shortest route is the best so that uh, what they think is going on is the dashed green line what actually is going on is the solid red line that can actually happen and on the next slide you will see how exactly it happens now on this slide you can see a diagram from the first part and this is the diagram that um, stands for the um, bidirectional reachability not for the bidirectional reachability um, still remaining independent of the other uh, TOVs as far as the specification is concerned because for the scope of this part of the bigger problem it doesn't make any difference if um, if the rest of the TOVs are uh, processed before or after the bidirectional reachability so for sake of clarity this part of this problem is explained 
um, using this kind of graph. But it can work on the other graph as well. Um, now, when they initially connect the speakers, that's what happens. There is a two-way exchange, and after the two-way exchange, there is the exchange of routes. That's how it normally happens. And after they first connect the devices, that's what has happened, and they have their routes in place. Now, what connects next? You can see on the next slide. Here you can see um, that there are still two original speakers in place, A and B, and B, um, the dash two lines going from router B towards router A, uh, they mean in this diagram that router B was sending a packet towards router A, but that packet didn't reach router A and instead was captured by somebody and stored in a, um, in a storage, um, in a storage of sorts. The fine print that um, I'm not sure is readable, but it should be. On router A, you can see you know, below the, uh, the label, it says, NM entry for router B, last successful TSPC number was 10,000 slash 5. That means that uh, router A and router B, they have already had an exchange of authenticated packets between themselves. And router A remembers router B so that it's protecting itself against a replay of those packets that um, it has already seen. And that NM entry is the entry in the authentic neighbor memory table as the authentication spec describes. Now, what router B continues to send is packets that have the TSPC number increasing. And below, uh, at the bottom of the diagram, next to the storage, you can see that uh, this process, if you repeat it for 24 hours or however long, uh, you can tell that the TSPC number of the first packet is bigger than, is greater than the number that router A remembers. And then 24 hours later, the TSPC number is even bigger. So those are legitimate TSPC numbers or cryptographic, cryptographic sequence numbers. They're fully legitimate. They are valid and the packets are authentic, except they don't reach router A. So that router A don't, doesn't see those packets. That's the problem. If it sees those packets, then uh, it wouldn't, uh, it, it would discard those packets if they were replayed. But as far as the left speaker is concerned, they're not replayed because it has never received those packets. And then 24 hours later, there is a storage full of authentic packets that router B has sent and router A has never received. And then um, after some time, the real router B is disconnected. Uh, and in this picture, the three arrows leading to the, to the floppy, to the storage, they are shown as three arrows just for for the consistency of the diagram. In fact, it's one single packet dump. Uh, and there, the packets are stored with the timestamps. So if, if there was a delay between the packets of, for instance, five seconds uh, in the packet dump that's recorded so that when you play the packet dump back, you produce the packets with proper uh, interleaved um, bits of the protocol exchange so that you uh, maintain the timers and everything. And on the next slide, you can see how it works. When the other guy, um, the guy that owns Rutabi, the real Rutabi, goes home, uh, the guy that wants to impersonate Rutabi, who is not on, on the right, um, 
on the right speaker, you can see it's root sub b asterisk, which, which means it's not real. It's what it pretends to be. That's its goal, to pretend to be root sub b, but it's a different device. A different device with a, with a floppy. Mm, now it uses the floppy, the storage, to play the packets back. And in this diagram, the dashed line going from root sub b towards root sub a means something uh, different. It means the packet that router A C is received, uh, router A thinks it was sent from router B. And uh, as that device keeps applying the packets, and they reach uh, particular points of the protocol instance, uh, one speaker thinks that those packets come from respective proper uh, points of the protocol instance on the other end. And uh, because those replayed packets have proper uh, TSPC cryptographic sequence numbers, and they have um, uh, proper uh, integrity check values, and they come on right time, and they um, stay within the proper um, timer thresholds. Router A sees those replayed packets uh, as a perfect bidirectional reachable neighbor that sends an update. You see at the bottom of the diagram uh, between two green blocks there is uh, also a couple of arrows in both directions. So in that direction, that's the direction of updates going forth and back. And router A is satisfied with the bidirectional uh, detection with the two-way state of the neighbor. And thus it's satisfied with the updates that come from the same uh, origin as far as the router is concerned. So based on those replayed the packets are actually replayed, and as far as router A is concerned, it has no means to tell those replayed packets from normal packets, because it sends uh, hello TOVs, and it gets proper response, and so on, so on, so on, and as far as the spec is concerned, it's so perfectly working, except it's not a real device. On the next slide, uh, it would be nice to have a clean and smart diagram that tells that, that that's the solution to that problem, uh, if I knew what the solution is. So um, what I can do, I can state the problem. And now that states the problem. Uh, there conditions used to detect bidirectional reachability, they allow for this to happen in the original protocol. And when I tried to design the authentication mechanism, I did miss that fact. And I didn't add anything to address that part of the exchange because I thought it was already covered. In fact, it wasn't. So. At this time, um, the good news, it's not too late to fix it. And because it could be addressed in the original protocol or in the authentication mechanism, whatever it is, it's not too late to decide where exactly it should be addressed. Uh, there is an option to put some of the solution a part of the solution in the basic protocol and some other part in the security mechanism or just keep it um, somewhere in one place. And then the solution, what it may be. As far as I understand, that's the solution to that problem on the next slide. Um, Um, I've been thinking about it for a while, and it seems to me that uh, 
two-way exchange should, uh, like it has already been invented a long time ago, it should include unique numbers so that you cannot just replay a package. You have to send proofs that you have received the packet straight below that, straight, straight before that. And in TCP, that's a three-way exchange. And in Babel, it's, it's not a three-way exchange because it's a datagram-based protocol. So that it's two two-way exchanges extend of one three-way exchange. Um, as far as the difference between TCP and UDP goes, it, it has to be stated in different terms. But the overall principle is the same. There should be numbers, and those numbers should be exchanged forth and back to prove that the, uh, the, um, the entity sending the packets that this neighbor is receiving is not an entity recorded a long time ago, that it can actually hear us and then prove that it has heard us and then to respond back so that we, we can prove it has heard the message we sent a few seconds ago. Um, and the easiest way is to introduce numbers, uh, or I can anticipate sequence numbers, or it can be a Unix timestamp. For instance, as far as I can see it now, this number, the only property it has to have is it has to be unique over as a long period of time as possible. And it may be a timestamp, but it doesn't have to be a timestamp. That's how I see it at the moment. If you can add another property, you're welcome. That's so far, the only thing that I say about it, about this number in this generic principle of this solution of this problem. Now, particular options to do that are on the next slide. Um, can we see the next slide? Yeah, next, next slide is up here, particular options. Oh, it did freeze for a while. Uh, now, I see it. Um, I see four different ways to do this. Somewhat different, but still within the general guidelines. First is really simple, and it's here just for illustrative purposes, because that's not a good way to do that. Because there is already a number in Hello TV, it's 16 bit of uh, a strictly, strictly increasing uh, integer. But 16 bit is not enough because if you send a hello packet uh, only as often as once in four seconds and no more often, uh, then even sending it uh, once in four seconds and incrementing it every four seconds, you've got about uh, three days of uh, unique numbers, just three days, uh, which is not enough. Then um, another straightforward way, but still not a good solution, would be to extend the whole sequence number to up to 32 or maybe 64 uh, bits, and there is no nice way to do that because uh, um, the structure of Hello TV is already um, defined for 16 bits, so either you have to make it incompatible or you have to add a sub TOV and then it becomes not as clean as it could be. Um, and Still, te technically, it's an option, uh, so it's on this list. Then the next option is to uh, use the existing TSPC number, which is the cryptographic, se cryptographic sequence number from the authentication mechanism. And it's 48 bit, and it's already purpose for exactly that, to sequence the packets and to prevent um, 
to provide the, the base for comparison so that you can tell a packet that you have already seen from a packet that you haven't. Uh, but um, there is a drawback to this approach. Um, it is that in this case, um, the basic protocol would have to be more uh, intertwined with the authentication mechanism, which isn't really good because they are, as, as far as it's defined at the moment, they work best when they know as little as possible about each other, so that the basic protocol is um, a thing in itself, and then the authentication mechanism is a thing in itself, and there are only a few points of interaction between themselves, and there is um, some wearing so that you can be sure that you can do one task in one place and do it well, and not and that you don't have to remember about other bits of the protocol that uh, may have this um, number elsewhere. And in this case, on the third option, that's exactly what uh, uh, would happen. Uh, one part of the protocol would have to have this number, and then um, have it would have to remember that some other parts of the protocol also needs the same number, so that they have to coordinate to uh, to read and write this number um, in a proper way, so that there is no race condition or um, there are no duplicates and so on, so on, so on. So that that increases complexity. But strictly speaking, that uh, given the uh, complexity issues are properly resolved. Uh, the code complexity issues. As far as the design goes, the sequence number seems to be a good option. At the very least, uh, better than the previous two. Seems to be. And um, what is common between the first three options is that those sequence number have nothing to do with real time. So that um, if you want this um, proof of the bidirectional reachability to reach back into, uh, for instance, 10 days of real time, then you would have to translate those sequence number into real time somehow. And then, the, for instance, to have a table in the protocol instance that correlates sequence number with timestamps, and then to calculate, to, to work back into the amount of days, you have to look up the table and um, find the sequence number that you want to compare against. Um, this complexity would be common for all the three first ways to solve this problem. Then the last way to solve this, it looks really simple, um, involves no cryptographic sequence numbers whatsoever, no extra um, um, wearing violation. It's as simple as using the RTT extension. And that RTT extension, it uses the algorithm from NTP, Network Time Protocol. It sends uh, timestamps forth and back uh, piggybacked onto Hello and IHU TOEs, and based on that, uh, it can tell the round trip time it took for the exchange to happen. And it uses the minimal amount of um, data bits to produce that real time measure of the age of the exchange, and then it works it into uh, a hysteresis loop, and then uh, that provides a metric for a root, and then it does other things, which we're not concerned about. But uh, as far as I can see it now, as far as I can see it now, that uh, the very first result of that RTT extension, the age of the exchange, 
it can be used to discard the IQ TLVs that are more old than the threshold. For instance, anything that is resp in, in English that would be um, um, I want to discard any IQ TOVs that are found to be a response to a hello TOV that was sent more than 30 seconds ago, for instance. So that you set a threshold and then uh, you just compare the age of the uh, TOV uh, with that threshold and then discard it. And as far as I can see it now, this way it would make the um, the, the attack that they had described impossible because the the HUTLVs that were replayed they uh, if they contained that number then the real router A could tell that those responses are not valid responses they are responses for uh, for the messages that either it didn't send or send so much time ago that it doesn't remember, so it disregards it anyway. So there are four ways to implement that general principle. And it seems to me number three and number four are the ones that should be looked into. But uh, for consistency, I'm providing everything I could produce to actually implement this. Um, All right, Dennis, I realize you only have a couple more slides left, but we don't to, do we want to get through this so we have a little time for discussion and then time for the second presentation for this session. So. Uh, perfect. So the next slide is actually the, the final one. Okay. <laughs> As I tried to explain it at the beginning, uh, now probably, hopefully, you, know, you, know, you can now see that both those problems should be addressed. Because once you have a working two-way uh, bidirectional reachability detection and once you can once you have defined that everything else depends on that uh, proper bidirectional reachability detection then the problem is solved um, because if if you solve only one of those issues and don't solve the other then um, the, the, there is no point or there is little point in um, having a proper bidirectional uh, detection and then not using it to stage the other half of the protocol. Um, so I'm trying to say that both those issues should be addressed. Um, and for the second one, I need, I, I'm looking for feedback for both of them, but for the second one, I need for even more feedback because that's an interesting problem and um, hopefully some people would be um, willing to look into it and maybe they can provide their own solution or they can prove that what I'm proposing is wrong or right or whatever. That's um, request for comments. The comments are welcome. So thank you. And then if you have any questions, then I will just stand in by and um, just ask and I'll answer. That's it. Okay, so uh, Julius wants to speak, so I guess I can do that. Can you hear me? Um, Hello, yes. can you hear me? Uh, welcome, Dave. Your voice yeah. is a little distorted, but we can see you. I'm sorry, I don't have a better microphone. Is that comprehensible? Oh, better, better, better. Yes. Is that comprehensible? Yes. Okay. So, um, concerning your first point, could we please have slide seven back? It's the one called discussion decision. No, the next one. Yeah. So, um, uh, Appendix A uh, used to be, in the very first drafts of Babel, part of the main document. And uh, Joel Halpern convinced me to put it into an informative appendix. And I think he made some very good points. 
So the main point is that if Babel is successful, then it will be deployed on uh, links that are different from what we envision now. And we don't want to over constrain the protocol if there is a smart link layer. So I'd be very strongly opposed to moving the link quality estimation algorithm, which is very naive, to make it normative. I like it this way. I like it being informative. Concerning your second point, you're enti entirely right. If you haven't sent me a hello, you don't exist. I ignore everything from you because you don't exist. Go away. You haven't sent me a hello. So if it's not clear in the document, that needs to be clarified. I agree. I think that your third point is the same as the second one. As to the fourth point, I don't see what the problem is. Um, all that this pack says about acknowledgements is that if you send an acknowledgement request, if you receive an acknowledgement re uh, request, you must send an acknowledgement. It doesn't tell you what to do with the acknowledgements, how to deal with missed acknowledgements. And that's not necessary in the base pack, I think. Uh, could we please have slide 22? Um, I, That's like 19, sorry. I could respond yeah, to the points you're making on quickly. number seven if you want. Yeah, I'll finish quickly. Um, uh, uh, sorry, the one before, uh, slide 18. Okay, so here it seems to me pretty clear that that doesn't belong in the base pack. The base pack attempts to be as minimalistic as possible to make as few hypotheses about both the link layer and the authentication mechanism as possible. So there's no problem for me if you make extra requirements on the protocol in the security extension. So in the security extension, you may say something like, I need a TSPC. Or you can say something like this security mechanism depends on the RTT extension. And you know that I'm pretty fond of the RTT extension. So I think we're in agreement here. Uh, it's the latter two that are the right solutions. We don't want to put any extensions, uh, um, any more requirements in the base, in the base specification. Thank you. Um, I, I can respond if you want, if we have got the time for it. Yeah, we have two people in line here. I'm going to cut the line. I guess you can respond briefly, and then we'll get these two comments here. Go ahead. Uh, for the first part, um, it says some of the thinking made in Appendix A1. The keyword is some. In particular, uh, when the spec says that when you miss an HU, uh, and then you have to set TX cost to zero. Uh, that's the bit I was working through to make those slides, uh, to make the diagram. There is no place in the spec that says what TX cost must be set to initially. It's implied that TX cost should be set to, must be set to zero when you create a neighbor when you receive a hello, but that bit is missing. and that specific bit needs to be in the normative text. The link quality estimation can and should remain in the appendix, but the, uh, the very first, um, just a few sentences need to be moved from appendix to the main body of the document. That's the point I'm trying to make. And then the, the second uh, point on the same seven slide, uh, it's that the green TOVs should be uh, regarded only after you've got an IHU, so that after you have two irishability, you can do anything else, not just one way. Uh, but that's, um, we can discuss it later. So if there are any more questions, I would be good to hear. Yeah, in, the, in the line here, go ahead. Um, yeah, John Dowdle, it's, it's, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, you seem to be going around the same points that we did in uh, Mane on the uh, AODV version 2 for about a year or so. Um, AODV v2 is, uh, is, is just expired as a draft. I think there'll be another one along fairly soon. Um, but you're very welcome to uh, take a look and, and borrow bits that uh, you find useful. 
Um, also a comment that, I, that uh, just looking at your sort of uh, authentication piece, um, there was a uh, an add-on to RSC 544, which is the, the transport mechanism between ad hoc routers, um, which has been used in AWD v2. So AWD v2 says, sends messages rather than packets. Um, and there's a, um, a, a placeholder in um, an RFC that goes with 544. I can't remember the number off the top of my head uh, for how to put an where to put an authentication piece. And there's also a uh, an RFC on um, identity-based signatures, which has very recently been published in in Mano. So there's a whole load of tools that you could use from from the work that's been going on in Mano, uh, which which may or may not be helpful. I'm not saying it is going to be helpful in this case, but it's worth looking at just to see if there's stuff that's uh, that that is helpful. Thank you for your comment. I remember looking through some of those documents. Mm, maybe not all of them, and there are, I remember there were some good bits that mm, were good for their purpose, but uh, I couldn't um, actually project them into this problem space because of the difference in encoding and or the way the packets are exchanged. I don't remember what exactly it was, but mm, I did make an attempt to see what other people are doing. Uh, don't remember everything, but I tried. Um, okay. I can try once, once again. It's yeah, yeah it'd, be, it'd be worth posting on the mail list. Yeah. Um, I mean, particularly with Charlie Perkins and probably uh, um, Victoria and Lottie, who are two of the co-authors for ADV V2, because we we went we were, went through an awful lot of pain on this, particularly the whole sequence number thing as well. Um, so yeah. Okay. Hi, David Skenazi, Apple. Um, so a couple quick points. Uh, so for, for, for the security part, uh, I personally really like the um, putting the TSPC in uh, I, I heard you packets that like from a cryptographic perspective, it's just the simplest way and it really fits in with like I heard you is exactly that. So I heard you with TSPC. So I, that would be a sub TLV and that, that, that sounds like it would fit in as a good extension. Uh, other point back to your first part, um, I totally agree with you that that part of the spec is unclear. I can tell you that because apparently I got it wrong. Um, in my implementation, what I ended up doing was that if I hear something from someone, I treat them as a neighbor, and if I don't get enough hellos, then I treat that as a neighbor with an infinite metric, but I still like respond to stuff. So. We definitely need to clarify that. However, I don't necessarily agree that uh, the way you propose to clarify it, which feels like restrictive on the protocol, is necessarily the way to go. Because uh, one of the things I feel is most restrictive of Babel today is the hello packets, because they serve two purposes. One is neighbor discovery, and the other one is to measure link quality through drop rate. Uh, the, fir the first one can be done out of bounds and the second one can be done through the link layer. So putting more requirements on what you're supposed to do with receiving hellos or lack thereof sounds a little restrictive, but I think we should probably discuss that longer uh, on the list. Yeah, okay, Thank I you. think we need to move on and we can discuss all these uh, actually interesting topics and uh, uh, kind of meaty stuff uh, on the list. Uh, Shall I release the camera? Hmm. Um, Donald, shall I release my camera and microphone? Probably, yes. I, that would okay. be good. Okay, so uh, this is the next item on the agenda. So, if, uh, Sandy, you want to come up here? Uh, you can move the slides with this. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandy Zhang from ZTE. Um, it's a pretty attention for beer in Babel. Next. Okay, do you want to do it or you want me to do it? You can, oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, beer. Beer is a bit indexed explicit replication and Beer introduced a novel architecture for multicast 
packeted forwarding. It does not require our cycling protocol to explicitly build multicast distribution trees. Nor does it require intermediate nodes to maintain any per flow state. In order to forward beer encapsulated package, some beer key parameters should be conveyed by the routing protocol. The key parameters include subdomain ID, BFID, MPRS info, bit string length, and so on. Bevel. Bevel defines a distance vector routing protocol that operates in a robust and efficient fashion both in ordinary world as well as in wireless mass networks. And Bevel uses several TLVs <coughs> to carry the routing information. And Bevel can also use new TLVs to convey their information as, as our intent. This document defines a way to convey their information in Bevel. Mm. Um, because um, Bevel is used to convey the uh, prefix of the network and uh, beer. If we want to use beer in the network, we must convey the beer information of nodes uh, around the network, uh, the network. So beer information can be encapsulated in uh, Babel update message to be forwarded to the every node in the network. And uh, the prefix, the prefix that the uh, beer information must be encapsulated, must not be summarized and the according sub TLV must be treated as optional and transactive. And, and it's the Format of the TLV. The first one is the beer sub TLV, and and this is the basic TLV of the beer information. It is used to transfer the subdomain ID and BFID. And the second is the MPRS encapsulation sub sub TLV, and this information is used to transfer the MPRS information of beer. And the third is the uh, optional subdomain. It's string length conversation sub sub TLV. And there is several uh, extension existed for beer, um, such as ECS extensions, OSPF extensions, and the BDP extensions. So we think that a Babel um, may be used to transfer the beer information so beer can be used in Babel network. That's all. Any comments? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. There, yeah, Julius. Oh. So, um, okay, I think that's really cool. I'm really uh, happy to see that. I have a few minor concerns about your draft. Uh, so to start with the technical concerns, um, uh, I've read your draft and there are a few things that feel very much like OSPF or ISIS and don't feel really fit really well with Babel. So you speak about transitive, you speak about optional. Babel does not have the transitive and optional bits. So uh, that needs to be reformulated in Babel terms. So depending on the exact semantics that you need, that means either putting a sub TLV or using a new TLV or using a new address encoding in Babel. So that's a technical point that we should discuss on the list, how exactly those things should be encoded in Babel. The other point is that you're using sub sub TLVs. We don't have sub sub TLVs in Babel. We have TLVs and sub TLVs. We have two registries. The parsing is not recursive. You cannot dump TLVs within sub-TLVs. So if you want sub-sub-TLVs, it means creating a new registry of sub-sub-TLVs and stuff. So again, we need to think about what is the right encoding. Perhaps the right solution is to add sub-sub-TLVs to Babel, but if yours is the only extension that requires them, I'm wondering whether it's worth the hassle. Um, more generally, 
uh, I found your, I mean, I was a little bit, how to say, I felt that I would have liked to hear more about your draft because your draft only speaks about the packet encoding. It doesn't tell me what to do with the data. So I'm a Babel router, I receive your sub-TLV. Okay, what do I do with it? And that's something that's not in the draft and that's not in the references. So I think it's, I mean, that's a purely editorial comment, but it badly lacks in background. For me, who doesn't really understand beer, I've heard about beer, but I don't understand it. I found it very difficult to work out what I'm supposed to do with it. And finally, do you have a prototype? Prototype? Or are you willing you, to work on a prototype? Are you willing to collaborate on a you, prototype? Have you implemented it? And um, uh, uh, does Julie means that the beer? No, no. Well, 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 beer and pro, beer and Babel. Beer have and you Babel. have you implemented Babel and implemented beer extensions to it? Yes. Okay. Beer extension. Yeah. You do have you do an implementation. Oh, code. Yeah. Existed code. Yeah. Uh, not yet, but we will try. <laughs> okay, so you are willing to work on a prototype? Yes. That's great. Okay, so I guess we should get in touch on the list about that. Thank you. Oli Atlas, so I have three thoughts about this draft. Some of them are scope and how to do it if there's interest. Um, the first part is whether doing beer in Babel makes sense given where Babel is likely to be deployed and the you know implementations in OpenWRT and such. If if there are going to be software routers or, or hardware routers in this space that are capable of doing the beer forwarding, right? Because it's let's be blunt, beer is basically a new data plane. Now we'll see what ends up happening as far as the IPv6 uh, encapsulations, but regardless, you're still doing something other than the standard lookup that one would do for a unicast packet, IPv6 packet. So one of the questions is, while we can do this, is it likely that the equipment that would be running Babel would need to do this or be capable of doing it? A second piece there, in as much as Babel is of great interest to the HomeNet working group, and they do not currently have, to my knowledge, and others of you are much more active there, I just lurk on the mailing list like all the others, um, is do they have a multicast solution? I know that the home net architecture talks about multicast and refers primarily to PIM, and there doesn't seem to have been a lot of thought there. If there's interest in doing beer in that space to solve the multicast issues for HomeNet, then this is pretty interesting, right? <laughs> but those are a couple open questions. And I think that the working group, this working group, perhaps even the HomeNet working group, need to have some thought and discussion about it. Uh, hat off for a second. Itty hat off. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really cool idea. I think this is much nicer and easier to run in a home net than PIM would be, but we got to see if there's actually the focus and interest. Okay, so tossing the hat back on. <laughs> um, Beer is generally chartered to do extensions to IGPs to support beer, but that was with the expectation that the extensions were 
too mature protocols where it was really well understood and known how to extend them and there's a lot of common knowledge across the routing area as julius quite clearly demonstrated i don't think we're at that level of mutual understanding and simplicity of agreement in how to do extensions so it is not clear to me yet where the draft should land but i don't think we could make a decision about what to do with the draft until the first two questions are answered. So I would encourage the work and I'd encourage talking to Julius and others and Babel and, you know, doing an implementation and seeing if you can get clarity to help answer those two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have other comments or questions? Looks like not. Thank you very much. Thank you. So those are the only uh, agenda items. Um, when there's uh, we have five minutes left in this session, uh, is there is any announcements or questions or anything anybody wants to bring up? Uh -huh. Barbara Stark, I just wanted to mention I do still intend to pursue the um, information model stuff. I just didn't get a chance for this one, but hopefully I'll have one for March. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, then I'll close the session and uh, hopefully uh, see people on the list and at the next ITF meeting. Uh, is there anybody who did not sign the blue sheets? They're up here in front and can be brought back. Okay, thank you.